As we continue our study of the book of Job, we come to a section where Zophar is going to be uh, addressing Job. Um, And uh, I've been wearing these baseball jerseys, and uh, this idea hit me actually after um, I had started doing that, that this whole back and forth, and remember, sports for uh, those in Bible times really wasn't something that was emphasized. That came later when Greek culture was a part of the um, Bible world. And uh, so this is this was kind of their sport, this back and forth that they would have. And uh, it's almost like nine innings of a game. And we're into the third inning because these guys are going to be hitting Job with their thoughts um, three times, three times. And uh, he's alone. Job's alone when it comes to um, playing this game, although it isn't very fun, this game that's going on. But I want to pray as we're starting out. So, Father, I ask you that uh, you would use this time together uh, for your glory and our good. And thank you for this book of wisdom. And I ask you for that wisdom from above that you give. So we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, I've been talking to you about the fact that Uh, Job is poetry, and because of that, I've been looking at different poems that have had an impact on the history of our country and and other countries, this book, A Treasury of Poems, and this is a famous poem that you've probably heard before. It's a poem entitled, The Road Not Taken, by Robert Frost. Let me read this to you. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no steps had trodden black, Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And I was looking at the history, and remember we talked about the fact that there is a story behind the music. I was looking at this history, and when uh, Frost had um, wrote this back in the uh, 1910s, he spent those years, 1912 to 1915, in England, where he had this friend. It was another writer named Edward Thomas. And Thomas and Frost became close friends. And they took these walks together. And he sent a copy of this poem to Thomas. And Thomas took the poem seriously and personally. And many believe that he enlisted in World War I as a result of that poem that having such an impact. Uh, Thomas was later killed uh, two years later in the Battle of Arras. And that had a big impact on Frost. And I think about the whole idea of the road not taken. And my son-in-law and his dad, they go on these hikes together, and they have walking sticks uh, that have been made, uh, cut out of the wood, whittled down. And I asked my son-in-law about this, and it's something that he uses when he's um, walking because it actually helps them as they're hiking. And it's used uh, when they're looking for arrowheads, and they can take that and fish around in the, um, the leaves and the, the ground there. It also, for many reasons, can help give a rhythm when people are walking. Uh, it also can, if they come upon a creek and they don't know how deep it is, it can be used to uh, test that. It's just a wise thing to have if somebody is a hiker. And I had never thought about that. I, I just, not being a hiker, uh, that didn't seem to be something that was that important. But I was thinking about the whole idea of when we 
take a path and, and when we have something in our hand, when we're alongside somebody that we love and we're being able to just spend that time out in nature and, and talking with one another. Um, it doesn't seem that there's the distractions that so many times can, can hit us um, in this technological age that we live in. And I thought about Job would have loved to walk this path that he was walking with friends that would be an encouragement to him. Friends that would have come alongside him and uh, not been judgmental, not been people that uh, discouraged him. And we come to this, um, this time where Zophar is now being um, in front and center. He's called Zophar the Namathite. Maybe he's got a relative that years later would be on the New York Jets. We'll keep going. But this third friend speaks up, and the fact that Zophar spoke last would likely mean that he was the youngest, and uh, but he was also the harshest. Uh, we've had the names for Eliphaz, the eloquent, and Bildad, the brutal, and now we have Zophar, the zealous. And truth to him is tied up into dogmatism. It's, I believe these things because I believe them. He's got the world completely figured out. And uh, he's basically calling Job a wicked man. So let's, let's take our Bibles, and I hope you have your Bible opened, and you're working through this with me uh, today. But we come to chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. It says, Then Zophar the Namathite answered and said, Should a multitude of words go unanswered, and a man full of talk be judged right? Should your babble silence men, and when you mock, Shall no one shame you? He's, he's basically saying, how can I remain silent uh, with these lies that you are saying, uh, Job? Uh, this mockery that you are doing. Um, I, I want to encourage you, and we've been talking about that. We have to be careful with our friends. We cannot be people that are constantly waxing eloquent and, and thinking that we've got everything figured out. Because we do not know all that is behind uh, the curtain of their life. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. For you say, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in God's eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you. And we do know that God did speak. He called Job righteous back in chapter 1. We know that, but um, Job and his three friends don't know that. Look at verse 6. And that... He would tell you the secrets of wisdom. And there's two sides to God's wisdom. From our side, it appears to be tangled and confused. But from heaven's perspective, there's this beautiful picture that's being formed. We've talked about that before with the tapestry. Uh, God is working out what he needs to work out. And says, as we continue on in verse 6, For he is manifold in understanding, knowing then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. You think you have it bad, Job, he's saying. You should have it twice as bad as the bad that you are. Verse 7, can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven, what can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he passes through and imprisons and summons the court, who can turn him back? For he knows worthless men when he sees iniquity. Will he not consider it? It is true that men cannot find God, but aren't you glad that God has found you? Look at verse 12. But a stupid man will get understanding when a wild donkey's colt is born of a man. He's saying this empty-headed man uh, has as much chance of being wise as a donkey donkey does of giving birth to a man. Look at verse 13. If you prepare your heart, you will stretch out your hands toward him. If iniquity is in your hand, put it away, and let not injustice dwell in your tents. Surely then you will lift up your face without blemish. He's saying, put away your sin, Job. Then you can lift your face to him in innocence. Look at the second part of verse 15. You'll be secure and will not fear. You will forget your misery. You will remember it as waters that have passed away. 
It's all this misery is going to be like water under a bridge. Job, if you just confess your sins, if you just put this stuff away um, and this secret iniquity that you've been involved in, God would just take care of it. Verse 17, and your life will be brighter than the noonday. Its darkness will be like the morning. This guy has it all figured out. And you will feel secure because there is hope. You will look around and take your rest in security. You will lie down and none will make you afraid. Many will court your favor, but the eyes of the wicked will fail. All way of escape will be lost to them. And their hope is to breathe their last. And he's basically saying that not only will you go, will you be renewed and revived if you put away your sin, but your insomnia is going to be cured. You're going to be able to finally sleep at night and know that you did the right thing. But if you don't turn away from this sin, the only hope that you have as a wicked person is death. And all the time, God is just listening to this. Now think about this young man standing up and talking to Job like he is. Disrespectful. And if you've seen that recently, where there's times where we have young people stepping up and speaking in ways that um, as if they've got it all figured out. And I remember that even in my own life. There were times that I thought I had everything figured out. Times I, I, I regret the way I talked to my father at times. I, I wish that I could go back and, and just um, make that right uh, because I thought I had everything figured out. And even if I was right, it was how I communicated it. And so we just need to, to stop and, and uh, be wise. And so that first point of the message was notice the altercation. Point number two is notice the allegation. And now Job is talking again. And so we keep moving on in these innings of this ball game. Look at verse 1 of chapter 12. Then Job answered and said, and so we have him talking. He's speaking in his own defense. Verse 2, and this is a great verse. This is a great verse. No doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. When you die, wisdom will leave the face of the earth. You guys have it all figured out. He is completely sarcastic. He is probably angry. And can you blame him after what he's uh, been through? Look at verse 3. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Who does not know such things as these? You know, you think about the times in the word where it says, esteem others better than yourselves. Do you know why God says that? Do you realize that everybody that we come in contact with does something better than you, does something better than me? And when we speak to people, if we ever speak to them as inferiors, God is not pleased. And you see the frustration on Job's part. He says, I'm not inferior to you. Basically, why, why are you talking to me this way? Uh, what are you guys telling me about the, the sovereignty and justice of God? This is common knowledge. I know these things. Look at verse 4. I am a laughingstock to my friends. I, who called to God and he answered me, a just and blameless man, am a laughingstock. He feels like a fool. In the thought of one who is at ease, there is contempt for misfortune. Is it ready for those whose feet slip. You see, life is easy. This is going to be really profound, so get ready. Life is easy when it's easy. When you're on your side of the situation, you've got life figured out. But, verse 6, the tents of robbers are at peace, and those who provoke God are secure, who bring their God in their hand. He says, look around. Bad, see, bad people seem to be doing very well. Verse 7. But ask the beasts, and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens, and they will tell you. You think about it, you, you can In nature, they know that this is the way it is. I mean, you think about it, When you go to the beach, and you're sitting there, and let's say you're eating a bag of chips. And you take one of the chips and you throw it on the sand. Do the seagulls go after you to another seagull? No. They, it, they're fighting for it all. 
And it's a jungle out there. And, and this is what's going on. The strongest one seems to be the one who survives. This is how Job is feeling as he's watching these things. He's saying, doesn't this make sense? Or look at verse 8. Or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you. He's saying, look at the fish. The shark wins. Not always the good guy. I mean, he's looking, he says, look at the fish. They're wise. I mean, they, they're in schools. Verse 9 and 10. But who among you... All these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. He said, who made the world this way? The Lord. Look at verse 11. Does not the ear test words as the palate tastes food? Just as the mouth determines whether food is bitter or, or sweet, my ears can determine words that are true or false. Verse 12, wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. With God are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding. If he tears down, none can rebuild. If he shuts a man in, none can open. If he withholds the waters, they dry up. If he sends them out, they overwhelm the land. With him are strength and sound wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away stripped. And judges, he makes fools. And that ancient wisdom, he's alluding to uh, the ancient of days as he's talking about this, this long time wisdom. We see this in Daniel chapter 7, verse 22. It says, until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. God is in charge. God knows what's going on. Look at verse 18. He looses the bonds of kings and binds a waist cloth on their hips. He leads priests away stripped and overflows the Almighty. He deprives of speech those who are trusted and takes away the discernment of the elders. God reduces kings to slaves if he chooses, is what he's saying. Verse 21, he pours contempt on princes and loosens the belt of the strong. He uncovers the deeps out of darkness and brings deep darkness to light. He makes nations great, and he destroys them. That's good to know. He enlarges nations and leads them away. He takes away understanding from the chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a pathless waste. They grope in the dark without light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. He's contending, Job is contending, that leaders and governments on earth, they come and go, but God is king of kings. And so he's in complete control. He wants to put his faith and trust in God. Point number three, notice the argument. Behold, my eye has seen all this. My ear has heard it and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. And so Zophar is waxing eloquent. He's talking about God's sovereignty. And he's saying, I, 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 can know, I know that God's in control of these things. Verse 13, chapter 13, verse 3. But I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue my case with God. He wants to reason with the Lord. He wants to speak directly to God because he knows in his heart he hasn't done anything wrong. It's like that verse from Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Verses 4 and 5. As for you, you whitewash with lies. Worthless physicians are you all. Oh, that you would keep silent, and it would be your wisdom. He's concluding that his counselors are no help at all. He's saying the wisest thing you could do is shut up. And you think about that. There's such wisdom. Remember, in school, the old teachers would say, hush, and uh, we'd better be quiet. And there's times where to just be silent, to just listen. And uh, I can think back to, I don't know how many times that uh, I regret saying something, but I... I don't regret 
the times that I've been silent. Um, Let's keep going. Verse 6. Hear now my argument and listen to the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak falsely for God and speak deceitfully for him? In attempting to defend God, you're actually offending him, he's saying. You're speaking on his behalf, but you're not speaking the entire truth. Verse 8. Will you show partiality toward him? Will you plead the case for God? Will it be well with you when he searches you out? Or can you deceive him as one deceives a man? He will surely rebuke you if in secret you show partiality. He said, are you arguing for God? Are you prepared to have him search you? You're saying all this stuff, but do you realize that the things you're saying to me, if the tables were turned and you were being questioned on this stuff, could you handle it? Because if you show partiality, you're guilty of hypocrisy. Verse 11, will not his majesty terrify you and the dread of him fall upon you? You have a lack of fear of God. Don't you realize that you should be afraid of him? Verse 12, your maxims are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of clay. You talk, your talk is brittle, it's frail, it's, it's breakable, it's ashes. Verse 13, let me have silence and I will speak and let come on me what may. He's saying, don't interrupt me. I'm going to say what I want and let the chips fall where they may. Verse 14, why should I take my flesh in my teeth or put my life in my hand? Though he slay me, I will hope in him. And this is where Satan is watching this. Remember, there's this back and forth in heaven even. And Satan's losing the bet here. Because it's not based on... Remember what he had said about Job? The only reason he's following you, God, the only reason he's following you is because it benefits him to follow you. Well, there's no benefit now. And so Job, in that verse, though he slay me, I will hope in him. I will trust in him. Verse, second part of verse 15. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. I love that, that God allows for that. He goes, I'm going to defend my position. Verse 16. This will be my salvation, that the godless shall not come before him. He goes, I'm going to be vindicated because he won't allow this hypocrite uh, to be victorious. Verse 17. Keep listening to my words and let my declaration be in your ears. Behold, I have prepared my case. I know that I shall be in the right. He's going to, I trust God. I'm going to keep presenting my case. Verse 19, who is there who will contend with me? For then I would be silent and die. He's saying it's up to me. If I don't make my case, if I don't stand up for myself, I'm going to die here. Verse 20, only grant me two things. I love this. Then I will not hide myself from your face. Withdraw your hand far from me. And let not dread of you terrify me. So he's saying, I want you, but please don't don't have these things continue that are, uh, take your hand of punishment off of me, but don't make me fear what you're going to do tomorrow. It's like that, the idea that a child that knows their parent loves them and they've just been punished, but they want to be held because they know that is where true safety lies. Verse 22. Then call and I will answer, or let me speak and you reply to me. How many are my iniquities and my sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. He's saying, how much have I sinned? Does it merit this kind of misery? And I want to ask you, in these times that we're at right now, where many times we were able to, if we'd be willing to stop and get alone with God and to ask him that. How many are my iniquities and my sins? Have you ever prayed that? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. If we're constantly, I'm okay, I'm good, and never thinking about this. I think Job, because he's got friends that are reminding him it, but I think he's honestly coming to grips with, where am I at in my walk with God? And so this time is really making him think. Verse 24, 
Why do you hide your face and count me as an enemy? Wow. Are you hiding from me? Am I an enemy in your eyes? Verse 25. Will you frighten a driven leaf and pursue dry chaff? For you write bitter things against me and make me inherit the iniquities of my youth. He's saying, it must be something I did a long time ago. I'm being punished for the sins of my youth. It reminded me of this song. I don't know if you remember that chorus. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And we'd, we'd have a round. Listen to the words at one point in one of the uh, choruses here. Remember not the sins of my youth. Remember not the sins of my youth. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. So he's in that he's saying, don't I, I know I was uh, not the best kid at times. I know there were times that I wasn't behaving. Um, is this why? Is this why I'm going through what I'm going through? Verse uh, 27. You put my feet in the stocks. Think about that, that old colonial days punishment. You put my feet in the stocks and watch all my paths. You set a limit for the soles of my feet. Man wastes away like a rotten thing, like a garment that is moth-eaten. He says, I can't move on with my life. I can't move forward because I'm held prisoner by this punishment and I'm eaten daily by despair. Verse 1 of chapter 14. Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. Man doesn't live long. The time he has on earth is full of trouble. This is how he's feeling. Verses, verses 2 through 4. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me into judgment with you? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. How can you demand purity when I have impurity in me? Remember that Psalm of David after he had sinned with Bathsheba, Psalm 51, verse 5. He said this, he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So he's got, a, he's got an awareness of his sinfulness. He's saying, how can I be pure when I'm impure? Don't you love this? How the cross answers these questions. He's asking these theological questions that are truth. But because of Christ, we have an answer. Verse 5, Since his days are determined and the number of his months is with you, and you have appointed his limits that he cannot pass, look away from him and leave him alone that he may enjoy like a hired hand his day. He says life is short and he's asking God for a break from these trials before he dies. Verse 7, For there is hope for a tree, if it be cut down, that it will, be, that it will sprout again. And that its shoots will not cease, though its root grow old in the earth and its stump die in the soil. Yet at the scent of water, it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. But a man dies and is laid low. Man breathes his last. And where is he? See, if there's water around, even if a tree is cut down, it can sprout again. But he's saying, what about me? When I die, what's going to happen uh, to me? Verse 11. As waters fall from a lake and a river wastes away and dries up, so a man lies down and rises not again. Till the heavens are no more, he will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. Like water that evaporates or a flood that disappears in the ground below, so a man is not seen again. Verse 13. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath be passed, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. And that's that same cry. He wants to be remembered like the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 42. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's crying out to, to God. Remember me. Verse 14. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service, I would wait till my renewal should come. You would call and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands. This is that ultimate question that we need hope when it's bad. Verse 16, for then you would number my steps. You would not keep watch over my sin. 
And we have these sins. Um, And God, are you judging every step that I take? Verse 17, my transgression, look at this. My transgression would be sealed up in a bag. And you would cover over my iniquity. It reminds me of Psalm 103, verse 12, what he does with this bag. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgression from us. God takes that bag and throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. Chapter, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 17. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. That's what God does with that bag. And so Job is seeing this one side of this. I've got a bag full of sins. What's going to happen? And God is going to take care of it. He's going to, he's going to accomplish that through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, but the mountains fall, the mountain falls and crumbles away and the rock is removed from its place. The waters wear away the stones. These mountains and these rocks, they, they, the torrents wash away the soil of the earth. So you destroy the hope of man. And so God's going to destroy our hope and that's how he's feeling. Now we know it's not the truth. We know that we, we know about the end of the book of Job. But while he's in the middle, and I love that God allows this wrestling to go on because I've had times like this. I've had times of doubt. And God is allowing him to speak. And when it's all said and done, there will be answers provided at the end. You see this throughout the Psalms. You'll see David crying out to God. He's got a problem. He presents it to God. And by the time we get to the end of the psalm, his mind has changed because he's come in contact with the living one, the living creator that is in control. You prevail against him, verse 20. You prevail against him and he passes. You change his countenance and send him away. His sons come to honor and he does not know it. They are brought low and he perceives it not. We're going to grow old. Our memory is going to fade and we experience this pain physically and emotionally, because life is tough. And I don't know what to do. And he feels only the pain of his own body, and he mourns only for himself. He's completely frustrated. But now, point number four, notice the accusation. And we're moving through the game here. We're moving through this back and forth. And Eliphaz the eloquent is stepping up again. And remember, he develops truth from his revelation from his experiences, from his observation. Good verses 1 and 2. Then Eliphaz the Tem- Temanite answered and said, Should a wise man answer with windy knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? He's basically saying, once again, Job, you're full of hot air. Verse 3. Should he argue in unprofitable talk or in words in which he can do no good? But you are doing away with the fear of God and hindering meditation before him. For your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, and not I. Your own lips testify against you. He's saying, it's not my fault, Job. It's your own words that are condemning you. And it seems, and this is a huge thing that you and I need to be careful of. Eliphaz seems more concerned about being right than doing right. He speaks with no compassion. And you'll see that sometimes in an argument. Somebody could be right, but there's no compassion. And God is not honored. Verse 7, Are you the first man who was born? Or were you brought forth before the hills? Have you listened in the counsel of God? And do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not clear to us? This this whole speech rings a bell back to number 16, where three friends came to Moses telling him he's taking too much upon himself. Verse 15, both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, older than your father. And evidently, Job's uh, three friends were significantly older than he. Verse 11, are the comforts of God too small for you? Is God's comfort not enough for you, uh, Job? Second part of verse 11, or the word that deals greatly with you, 
Why does your heart carry you away? And why do your eyes flash? That you turn your spirit against God and bring such words out of your mouth. Let me ask you this, Job. What secret sin have you committed that has turned your heart against God and caused you to say things that you shouldn't have said? Verse 14. What is man that he can be pure or he who is born of woman that he can be righteous? You claim to be righteous, Job, but can any man claim that? And verse 15. Behold, God puts no trust in his holy ones. And he's right. Um, Satan even has access to heaven. We see here, and, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. So the Eliphaz did know something. Um, but verse 16, how much less one who is abominable and corrupt, a man who drinks injustice like water. And he's right. There's always another way to look at mankind. Look at this in um, Psalm 8, 4 through 9. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. And I love this. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Verse 17 of chapter 15 of Job. I will show you, hear me, and what I have seen I will declare. What wise men have told without hiding it from their fathers? Okay. To whom alone the land was given, and no stranger passed among them. The wise men of all know the truth, and they pass it on to others. Verse 20, the wicked man writhes in pain all his days, through all the years that are laid up for the ruthless. Dreadful sounds are in his ears. In prosperity, the destroyer will come upon him. And so he's indicting Job. He's, he's pointing his finger at him and he's saying, this was you. This is what you were like. Verse 22, he does not believe that he will return out of darkness and he is marked for the sword. He wanders abroad for bread saying, where is it? He knows that a day of darkness is ready at his hand. Distress and anguish terrify him. They prevail against him like a king ready for battle. You know what I see here that really bothers me is they are using Job's words against him. I remember there's been times that I've gone through difficult, deep waters, times that I was questioning things, that I, that I was hurting, and friends would come alongside me and they were encouraging me. They'd speak truth when I needed it, but they also listened. And I do not remember one of my friends throwing my words back in my face, even in those times of weakness. Uh, they, they didn't make me feel any worse than I already did. And they could have. They could have said some things that were just brutal because I had set myself up that way and they didn't do it. Please, I just encourage you, when you're coming in contact with a friend, don't be someone that is looking to use their words against them. It is so discouraging. Um, he's giving these impressions to Job. Look at verse 25. Because he has stretched out his hand against God and defies the Almighty, running stubbornly against him with a thickly bossed shield, because he has covered his face with his fat and gathered fat upon his waist. Uh, the only explanation is that this man had defied God. In verse 28, and has lived in desolate cities, in houses that none should inhabit, which was ready to become heaps of ruins. He will not be rich, and his wealth will not endure, nor will his possessions spread over the earth. And I find it interesting that he's, they're saying these things to Job in his difficult time, they're remembering, oh yeah, remember the days when you were, you were prosperous, you were kind of fat? Remember the days you were, you were prosperous? Remember, those were the days that you were taking advantage of people. So you think, these are his friends, this is what they thought of him when he was having those good days. And now it's coming out. Verse 30, he will not depart from darkness. The flame will dry up his shoots. And by the breath of his mouth, he will depart. 
It was a fire that uh, consumed Job's uh, sheep and his servants. And he's making these heartless and cruel references to Job's own experience. He's, he is putting in Job's face the pain that he had just experienced. And I mean, this is, this is horrible. Verse 31. Let, n- let him not trust in emptiness, deceiving himself. For emptiness will be his payment. It will be paid in full before his time, and his branch will not be green. Not only will this emptiness be this bad man's reward, but he'll be cut off in the prime of his life. Verse 33. He will shake off his unripe grape like the vine and cast off his blossom like the olive tree. And this is really cruel because it's an allusion to children, and he had lost 10 kids. Verse 34. For the company of the godless is barren, and fire consumes the tents of bribery. Now think about how Job lost his family. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil, and their womb prepares deceit. Now he's making this case theologically, but there's no compassion at all. And even if there was any truth, it is said without love. Um, I was thinking about that whole idea of this road less traveled and this hiking stick and how um, we go down the path of life. And it made me think of the the story of Moses and how um, Moses had that rod, that rod of God. And I don't know if you'd ever heard the song, you may want to look it up, by Ken Miedema, where he's talking about Moses and he's being confronted by God. And this, this gentleman, Ken Miedema, who's a blind gentleman, he's a pianist, and he sings this song um, just in an amazing way, the story of the back and forth of what God is saying to Moses and what he's expecting of him. And he gets the point in the song where he's saying to him, he's saying, do you know what it means, Moses? Do you know what I'm trying to say? The rod of Moses became the rod of God. So he's saying, what do you have in your hand? And he's going, all I've got is this rod. He goes, well, throw it down. And it turns into a snake and he starts running from it. And he's saying, now pick it up. And he's trying to get the point across that the only reason that you have any sort of power is because of me. He goes on, he says, the rod of Moses became the rod of God. With the rod of God, strike the rock and the water will come. With the rod of God, part the waters of the sea. With the rod of God, you can strike old Pharaoh dead. With the rod of God, you can set the people free. But then Medema has an ending chorus and he says, What do you hold in your hand today? To what and to whom are you bound? Are you willing to give it to God right now? Give it up. Give it up. Let it go. Let it go. Throw it down. And so as you're walking this path and you're trying to make things, figure things out, what's going on with our country? What's going on with your life right now? What's going on in the relationships that you have? What's going on in your family? What's going on with your spouse? What's going on with your kids? What's going on with your parents? What's going on at work or no work? And we're holding on to those things tightly and we're holding, and God's saying, what do you have, what do you have in your hand today? What are you holding on to? Would you let it go? Because in my hands, whatever that thing is, you can trust me with it. And so Job, Job's got these three friends that are giving him a bunch of truth, a bunch of theology, a bunch of thoughts. They're hammering him from revelation angle. They're hammering him from the educational angle. They're hammering him from the dogmatic angle. We can throw all that aside and to hold on to the truth of God that he can be trusted, that he loves us, that that he has the best in mind. He, he's not surprised by these things that are happening right now. He can be trusted. What do you hold in your hand today? And as you take the path, we're going down a path less traveled. Let's trust God and have no regrets. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your goodness and grace. Thank you again that we can look into your word for wisdom. 
God, help us to get it. Help us in our responses to one another in homes, um, our, our conversations, our texts, our phone calls, our internet back and forth, our social media. God, that we'd be gracious with one another, that we'd speak words of truth, but balanced by love. Thank you, Lord, that we can look to you for that wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.